We looked at uh, thematic relations yesterday, right? And uh, now we are coming back again to structural relations and we'll be looking at case. But before, and uh, these are the two questions which we need to understand. So what is case and how do we understand them configurationally? If I, if I ask you this question, what is case? Have you heard this word case before? Yes. Can you give a couple of examples of that? In, in which context did you hear this term case? Nay. Nay. What is that? Karta Karak. Karta. Karta is the name of a case and Karak is the Hindi word for case. Okay. Uh, anything else? Anybody wants to add anything else? No? Okay. Uh, so, there are, there are several of them. Case simply means uh, that in a different, in, in different positions in a sentence, okay, different NPs have different cases. What are the different positions in a sentence that you have seen so far? According to grammatical relations, the different positions are subjects and objects, right? Semantically speaking, we saw yesterday agent, theme, right? Sometimes patient, sometimes experiencer and several other themes. Again, talking about grammatical relations, a subject is supposed to have a different case and an object is supposed to have a different case. Okay? Uh, and this, this happens through a structural relations and this is what we are going to look at. Okay? But in a, give it a moment, I wanted to talk to you about these sentences where we stopped yesterday and then we are going to come back to structural relations in a moment. Remember these sentences? Simple ones, right? <laughs> now, what I want to know, what I want to ask you before is, did I, did I talk to you about two types of there, two types of that? And I, I talk to you that one is demonstrative pronoun and the other was anybody? There was another one too, right? Which was not demonstrative pronoun. Do you remember that much? There are two types. One is demonstrative pronoun when we say that pen or that room, uh, that boy. These are, demo these are examples of demonstrative pronoun if we are talking about that. But there are certain places where the same element that does not have the same meaning. So you, you know at least this much, right? So that, that's a different type of that. So we, we can say there are two types of such elements. Similarly, there are others, other elements in a language like English, which has at least two different functions. And Two of them are it and there. What, what do these two words mean, it and there? They are, they are also sort of pronouns, right? Which, uh, which uh, and as we know about canonical definition of a pronoun, pronouns are uh, replacing nouns, right? So in a way, they are nouns. But if you look at this sentence, it rained, what is the meaning of the word it? You know the sentence, if, if someone asks, okay, how do we say this sentence in um, Hindi? 
से वर्षा हुई थी द सेम सेंटेंस राइट हाउ हाउ डू आई से इट इज रेनिंग हो रही है राइट हाउ अबाउट तेलुगु वर्षम पड़ती ओके इधर वे इज फाइन फॉर मी इट इज रेनिंग हाउ डू यू से वर्षम पड़ती ओके same sentence of telugu can be translated this way it is raining right now what is the meaning of it in english in this sentence of english all of us all of you know these sentences right if someone asks you and, and the reason why i am spending a minute on this sentence is someone asks you how do you 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 know how to say the same thing in your language if someone asks you to translate or say the same thing same thing in english you are going to say this way it is raining or it rained or it rains right you don't have any difficulty with that keeping that in mind that you have no difficulty with that if someone learning english asks you this question what's the meaning of it how will you answer that question does it have any meaning we 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 need to move does it have any meaning and if it does what's the meaning am i ask am i asking a compl too complicated question am i I'm asking you a simple one of the simplest questions one can ask you in a college one can ask you this question even on a road right so i don't think i'm asking an intellectually challenging question i'm only asking you the meaning of a simple word and i don't think english has simpler words than this it what's the meaning of this word in this sentence it so no, i am not interested in noun pronouns or anything i'm only asking what's the meaning of the word it i have a sentence i have heard this sentence somewhere it rained you know english and i don't know i want to know what's the meaning of this word it signifies the happening of an event is that the meaning <laughs> is that the meaning of the word if someone asks you what's the meaning of uh, gulab jamun you say you get this in big stores and uh, uh, it it looks red it's sweet is that the meaning of this word that's in a way description of the word right now let's let's move move the point what's the point so it, at least you you can tell me something no sir should have a object what's the object object can be used as a sentence yes it should have some some subject ahead it should have some subject for that right very nice it's a complementizer i guess it's a complementizer you have heard the word complementizer before when i was discussing that right all right not everything is complementizer right not everything is going to, complementizer is not going to be solution for everything okay but very nice very nice i am right rain is used in noun yes that fall is a verb yes so verb fall has this uh, sure. subject yes but here rain is a verb where it should have a subject right and because is that it is that to complete the structure very nice absolutely you you are right but that's the next step right i i am not i'm i'm not hung on this uh, question but i want you to understand that if someone asks you the question what's the meaning of it right and without having 25 classes on principles and parameters if you tell them that because the sentence needs to have a subject the person is going to lose interest right however you are absolutely right there is absolutely no problem with what you are saying what i am trying to tell you is that's the second stage the first step and that's the very difficult step a difficult in the following sense to understand well what what i meant by difficult is it is very difficult to say no okay 
this word does not have any meaning. And this is why probably you have difficulty saying anything about it. Right? When I am saying, look at the sentence, anything, you have difficulty saying anything about it. In this sentence, it does it, does the word it has a meaning? Yes? In the, in the sentence that I just said, you have difficulty saying anything about it. phrase, it might become sort of repetitive. In case, in this first sentence, if we put the rain rained, it becomes very repetitive. So, the, we need something which does not explicitly say the rain rained or something like that, but something else to substitute it. Uh, sort of okay, but his answer is better. Yeah, you, you no, see, no, I understand. It does not have any meaning, it does have a meaning. I, I understand what you are trying to say, but I want you to understand, do you understand what you said? And before that, I want you to understand what I am saying. What I am saying is, this word does not have any meaning in this sentence. Why it is there and what else could have been there and what, why something else could not be there are the stages later. Given the sentence, this is a grammatical sentence of English. In this grammatical sentence, this word does not have a meaning. Okay? Now, the second stage is, if it does not have a meaning, what is it doing? Okay? What is it doing here? It is doing exactly what he was, he is trying to say. That every sentence, irrespective of English, Hindi, Telugu, Malayalam, every sentence must need a subject. Now, and here comes what you are saying. It, there is no point saying rain raining. Right? The same thing we can say by raining. But we cannot say raining. And he, he gave you another example, a very nice example. When we say rain falls, it is a good sentence. Rain is the subject, fall is the verb. Right? It is a good, good uh, it's, that is a transitive verb, but let us let's move ahead with that. That is a good sentence. It has a subject, it has a predicate. The sentence is, seems to be all right. But when we say raining or rains, does not mean much. Does not mean much in the sense that it is not grammatical because it, is, it does not have a subject. And remember, it is not even a sentence like go home. Right? Go, we can say go. Can we say rain? Right? We, we are using this as a verb, it is raining, but we cannot say rain because when you say go, you are telling someone. When you say rain, who are you talking to? You understand the point? We just cannot say rain. So, it is not an it's not a imperative sentence either. Therefore, it needs a subject and in certain cases, when there is, it is just not possible that we do not have a subject. This sentence is not allowed in English or for that matter in any language. We know that this sentence was okay because we have this, right? This is okay, but this is not okay sentence. Therefore, the words, do you see here uh, in blue? it is written expletive, expletive. Okay? So, there are two, two elements in English, both of them are listed there, it and there. They, in their expletive forms, are used to fulfill the requirement of a subject without any meaning. So, we say it rains, it just fulfills a grammatical function, supplying a subject to the sentence, making sentence grammatical without any meaning of the word it. So, the word, so in, in that case, the sentence is it rains or it is raining or it rained or whatever, where this sentence is semantically null, semantically vacuous, semantically zero. Grammatically, it is a subject and it is only fulfilling the grammatical function of providing a subject. That's the that's that's the point 
being made here. Now, Sandeep, about complementizers. So, that was a complementizer in the case where we, we saw, and the name of this thing is again something like, what's the name? It's not a pronoun, expletive, or there is another term, pleonastics. Doesn't matter what, whatever you call it. I want you to understand that this is semantically zero, which fulfills only grammatical function. The another term there has sometimes the same function. I, am, I have digressed a little bit from what we were going to do, but this is an important point. Can you give me a sentence with there, where there functions as a subject of the sentence? There has been a class. A class, okay. There are there are twenty students here. Right? There are twenty students here. Can we say simply are twenty students here? No. We can say twenty students are here. That's fine. In that case, twenty students become the subject. But we cannot say are twenty students here. In that case, we have to use a word with, which is semantically zero again to fulfill the requirement of the subject. And then the sentence becomes, there are 20 students in the class. Okay? And the sentence becomes good. Again, now think about the same sentence with the question that I have been asking you. What is the meaning of there in that sentence? There are 20 students in the class. What is the meaning of there? The answer is nothing. Though that word does not have its meaning and therefore semantically zero. These elements are called the word that without its demonstrative meaning is a complementizer. The word, words there and it without their meanings are called expletives. So, complementizers and expletives are in a language only to fulfill grammatical functions. Clear? Okay. Uh, now, I have put the term extended projection principle for that. Okay? I just wanted to uh, bring in this term when subject must be present in a sentence, the principle is called extended projection principle. That is, no, and, and by name you can see it is a principle. So, no language is allowed to violate this, thi this thing. Every language must follow that, which means every language must have the subject. And this principle is called extended projection principle. And in order to obey this kind of a principle, English in such cases uses a different term, but does not leave the subject position empty. It, it copies the same it, becomes semantically zero and uses in this term, in this place. Makes a word, copies a word there, uh, uses in, this, in, the, in a sentence in the subject position and does not leave, a language like English does not leave the subject position empty. Okay. Also keep in mind that these sentences are not like English, not like Hindi sentences or sentences from our languages where we can say ghar ja raha hun. Understand? Understand my question? Understand my sentence? When we say ghar ja raha hun, in this sentence of Hindi, the subject position is not really empty. What is the subject position? Subject in this sentence? May. Therefore, not an empty subject. Therefore, the sentence is good and grammatical and subsequently not violating extended projection principle. But if we leave these sentences raining or rained, the subject is not recoverable from the context or anything else, from the inflection. Subjects are not recoverable from inflection. Therefore, it needs an overt subject. How you manage that is the language internal problem. And language finds a way to resolve this issue. 
and this is how it resolves. Clear? We understand extended projection principle? Go ahead. Uh, no, no, but I want you to answer one more question. In, in the response to your question, if I say no, right, what is the basis of me saying such an emphatic no? Native speaker. No, 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 not just the native speaker. That, that's fine because I, because I am a native speaker, I can say no, no, no. no. Here, I, here I want you to uh, allow me a minute of digression again. A native speaker's capacity or capability is to give you a judgment about the sentence. The native speaker's capability is to identify a sentence whether a sentence belongs to Hindi or not. A native speaker's capability is to give you judgment about whether a word belongs to Hindi or not. For example, you use this word expletive. Ask any Hindi speaker whether they know Hindi or not. I am sorry, whether even if they do not know even if they do not know a single word of English, they will tell you at least that this word does not belong to Hindi. Am I right? So, that is the capacity of a native speaker. The capacity of a native speaker does not include telling you, does it have any expletive? Understand the, understand the, the, the question does not belong to native speakers. The, the question is grammatically motivated and I am saying no. Why am I saying no? Because a language like Hindi, okay, uh, by now you have seen complete IP, right? By now you have seen what is I, what do we call inflection, and you have seen the role of inflection in a sentence. So, when we say ghar ja raham, the subject I, which is main, is recoverable from inflection. The inflection tells you that the subject is recoverable. That, that sentence can only have the subject may. If a language has rich inflection system, it is highly likely that the language will not have expletives. Expletives are used only when subjects are not recoverable. See, it is a, it's a, it's a plain logic. If we, do, we, if, if we do not have rich inflection to recover subjects, then we need expletives. In a language like Hindi or Telugu or Malayalam, why would you need an expletive? However, like I said, most likely no, there might be a context or two in which something may be used as expletives. So, it, it will be too tall a claim to deny that right away, right? But most likely it will not have an expletive like situation. All right. Expletives, extended projection principles, requirement of a subject, revisited, are these things clear? Inflection, huh? good. Uh, Let us move. So, along the same lines, I just wanted to repeat one more point, which we have discussed time to time, that, and, and, and because we are talking about inflection, uh, uh, in fact, we before this we were talking about inflection and expletives and extended projection principle. In this context, let me make one more point about autonomy of syntax. Even <coughs> yesterday, I guess we were talking about talking about autonomy of syntax. Am I right? Yesterday or maybe the day before yesterday, we were talking about autonomy of syntax. In the sense that, so there are there are going to be two positions. One is syntax is completely autonomous. That is, there is no overlap between syntax and semantics. Semantics is an independent thing and syntax is independent of semantics. Okay? That is one position. And we have sentences like uh, colorless green ideas sleep furiously or the, build, building, the building is walking slowly. These are the sentences which can tell us that these sentences irrespective of the meaning are grammatically good, right? which tells us syntax seems to be autonomous. However, the other position that to some extent syntax may be autonomous, so that we are not denying the first position, but it does not seem to be autonomous all the way. And that, that was the position which I introduced to you yesterday when we were talking about thematic relations. Right? There is one, 
I want to give you one syntactic argument in support of this second position. That syntax doesn't seem to be completely autonomous. It is autonomous to a great extent, but not all the way. Look at the two sentences. John hit Peter. Okay? And John, I'm sorry, the first one is John hits Peter. Right? And John hit Peter. And the third sentence is John and Mary hit Peter. Okay? Now, these are pretty simple sentences. Can I quickly ask you to draw the structure of this very simple sentence, John hit Peter, in terms of its IP? The structure will be we have an IP. All right? PP and we have so in this specifier position of the IP we have an NP which is John right <coughs> and then <coughs> we have the verb hit and the, it has an object which is an NP and this object is <coughs> Peter. Do we, do we have this structure, everybody? I, I have purposely elaborated this thing, the object NP for you to make, to reiterate one more point which is the object of this head, the object of this head is this entire NP. The object of this head is entire NP, not just Peter. And as long as we know the whole <coughs> NP is the whole, Peter is the whole NP, we can, we do not need to draw, we can just write it here. Conceptually, we need to understand this with clarity that the object of this head, V, which is hit, is the entire NP, not just the head of this NP. Because in such a case, suppose we say John hit the monkey that was running on the road in the evening. Okay? John hit the monkey that was running on the road in the evening. In this case, what is the object of the verb hit? What is the object of the word verb hit? The monkey that was running on the road in the evening. The entire chunk and what is that chunk? Configurationally speaking, what is that chunk? an NP. Okay? It will have an N and then it will have a complement, whatever rest of the things will be complement of that N. Alright? So that and that this becomes clearer only when we know that the, the complement of this head V is the NP, not the N. Okay? Alright. So that was another that was another point in this context. Now, keeping this, uh, elaborating on the second point of this argument about autonomy of syntax, I want to tell you, I want to ask you this thing. So, if first sentence, John hits Peter, what do I put here? In terms of uh, agreement, singular, and which is S, right? Now, in terms of uh, second one, so hold on, hold on. So, and what is the tense here? Present tense, singular agreement, present tense and then there is an, uh, there is an some kind of aspect also. Can I ask you the, this question, what is, which, which aspect is here? 
infinite, indefinite aspect, right? All right. Now, so this is the sentence number one. Tell me about sentence number two. Singular past tense. So we have singular agreement and tense is past, right? All right. How about third? Third sentence. John and Mary hit Peter. Plural present. So agreement is plural and uh, tense is present. Why not past? So pretty simple sentence. I'm asking a simple question. Why not past? Why can't it be both present and past? That's what my question. No, no, no. A sentence at a time cannot be both. In the context, we might be able to. That's the precise point I'm trying to make. Hold on for a moment. Hold on. Why not just look at the sentence and remove the context? That, that's the exact point we are trying to make. Remove the context and just look at the grammar of the sentence. Looking at the grammar of the, that, that, and I, I must, I'm, I'm repeating this because that's the exact point we are trying to make. Looking at the sentence, grammar of the sentence, it's difficult to say about sentence number three, whether it is present or past. Understand this? In order to say that here, we need to talk about its extra sentential features that is context. The moment we need to depend on context, right? context is not grammatical feature. We will have to say that syntax cannot be totally autonomous. Get my point? Look at the, look at the, sim the simple sentence and kinds of uh, clarity it gives us at a conceptual level. So one, we, it's a nice sentence, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. And we, we get a nice point that no, uh, syntax seems to be autonomous. The sentence is still good, even if it doesn't mean much, the sentence is fine. We are not denying that point. We are, we are saying that to a great extent, syntax seems to be autonomous of semantics, syntax seems to be autonomous, but only to some extent. In lot of sentences, it's not very clear. And as long as we have one example available, we can very well make a claim that it does not seem to be completely autonomous. We do not need to have quantitatively lot of examples to demonstrate the point. That's the beauty of science. That's the beauty of a theoretical point. We don't need quantitatively a lot of examples. It's not a quantitative survey where 70% of people response, 70% of responses is yes and 30% responses is no, then we take it as yes. Right? It's, not a, it's not a quantitative survey. It's a theoretical point. It's a scientific investigation. And any principle, let's not lose the track. We are talking about principles and parameters of natural language. A single point must be explained in order to dismiss that completely. So if someone wants to keep just one position, position number one, they must answer this question. And as long as this question is not answered, the second point remains valid. Clear? All right. Uh, uh, so that's about, that, that's about uh, autonomy of uh, syntax. And uh, once again, we kind of uh, revised our thing for uh, IP. Go ahead. Uh, one language which has stricter uh, gram grammatical rules can have com uh, complete autonomy of syntax. Could have. Sure. So Could have. You are right. So, for, a, for, a, for example, in a language like Hindi, you will not get this sentence at all. This kind of sentence at all. Sure. So, in, with Hindi, it's difficult to show that uh, syntax is not autonomous. 
You are right. Absolutely right. But that does not contradict the point. But because there exists exactly. a human language which has exactly. such, which accepts such a ambiguity. Which shows sentence. such a such a situation. The point is taken care of. And and see here, we are also not saying that because we found one point, the first point is dismissed. We are not saying that. We are saying that to a great extent it seems autonomous. To some extent it seems autonomous. All right, we can give up and say to a great extent it seems autonomous, but not all the way. That's the that's the point, and that's all we want to accommodate in the principle that can can't say all the way. Okay, and this thing is this thing. Uh, we we when I talked to you about autonomy of syntax for the first time, we were not ready to get this take this point. Uh, it would not have made much sense at this at that stage. I am I'm sure it's making more sense now. All right? Okay. Now, with that, we are coming to more of structural relations. Okay? More, we are coming to a discussion on case. And with these structural relations, with these terms, we will talk about case. So these are the terms we need to understand. These and these terms like precedence and dominance government, C command and M command. These are the few terms which we need to understand with respect to the structure, right? With respect to a structure. Precedence, dominance are simple terms. Uh, they do not have much meaning in that. Government, in, in day to day language, we understand something else with government. We need to add a specific meaning to that. What we mean by government in terms of a structure and a sentence, we'll talk about that. And then C command, the term means constituent command. Okay? Like in a sentence, we have several constituents like NP, VP, and again NP and PP. These are the constituents of a sentence. So they simply the, the term C command simply means constituent command. Okay? And the term M command means maximal command. So people don't use the words like constituent command or maximal command. In short, people use terms like C command and M command. We will elaborate on these terms as well. Uh, very simply, let me first... Uh, so I, I had this sentence, our good old sentence, uh, for the purpose of a sentence, but now we will work with the sentence that we have on the board. Right? We have just seen the sentence. So let's look at uh, the terms of precedence and dominance. It's a, it's a simple term. If I tell you, if I tell you that IP in this structure, okay, dominates everything, shouldn't be difficult to understand. Right? IP in this structure on the board dominates everything, which means dominates everything below it. And this is exactly what we say. A node A dominates a node B if and only if A is higher up in the tree than B. And there is a line tracing A to B downward. Right? The, the second, second condition is just to restrict it. Okay? So, node A dominates node B only if and only if A is higher up in the tree than B and there is a line tracing A to B downward. This is exactly what we were saying when we said IP dominates everything. By everything? What do we mean by everything? IP dominates NP, I bar, I, VP, spec, V bar, V, NP, and likewise. Okay? NP, the NP, the spec position, this NP clearly does not dominate IP, but does it dominate I bar given this definition? 
So this is how we need to understand dominance. Okay? And this term becomes important only in the sense that if we want to say in language, right, like subject dominates object, that statement is not going to be true. So we, we cannot say subject dominates objects. Understand this? So, so we, we need to define the term dominance only for such regions and this way. We are, we are not adding or deleting anything from the actual meaning of the term dominance. This is what it means, right? When in, in, in general also when we say dominance, dominance only flows downward. Dominance does not even flow at the equal level or upward, right? That is all. It means we are only restating the same thing configurationally. Same thing about precedence, look at that. Any difficulty with that? A node A precedes node B if and only if A is to the left of B and A does not dominate B and B does not dominate A. Understand this? So, in that terms, what can we say? This NP, right, precedes VP. Can we say that? Spec NP, NP in the position of a spec IP precedes VP. We can say that, right? We can also say this NP precedes I bar. Therefore, this NP precedes everything else, right? But the moment, the, the more we go downward, we cannot say spec of VP precedes I. I mean, that, that, that sounds li little bit ridiculous also, but just to make a point, I precedes everything else. This spec IP spec VP precedes V N P, V N N P, right? And again V precedes N P likewise. So, th we need to, we need to understand that these terms precedence and dominance in this term. So, uh, when we say uh, dominance aligned racing from A to B, uh, don't, uh, do we mean that it has to be at the top of the line? Or Going Say for down. example, uh, uh, there is NP John and then there is this VP. I can also go from like this. Going downward. 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 Okay. downward. Yes. Why do we need to say that? Downward. The, the question that you have in mind, just to eliminate that question. If we do not say downward, then what you are saying will be allowed then it will be allowed that this NP dominates this VP. Because there is a line tracing, after all there is a line tracing this VP. But from this NP, there is a line tracing this VP, but not downward. First it has to go upward. We want to restrict that kind of a situation where spec of IP will be dominating VP. We do not want to say that. IP dominates VP, I bar dominates VP, not even I. I precedes VP, NP precedes VP, but does not dominate, do not dominate VP. Just to restrict these kinds of situations, we are defining it this way, right? This is, this is a very carefully crafted definition. I, mean, I, I have not done this. This is, if you, if you look at your book, these definitions are there in, in chapter 2 or in some place. Okay? Just to, and, and again, uh, it has been restricted just to mean what we want it to mean. That is all. Right? Okay. Uh, I 
we already have the. Sir, uh, there is uh, more than one branch coming from the instructional phase, then we cannot compare the elements of branch, uh, one branch with, with the element of another branch, right? Uh, Say it again. Yeah. Say it again, please. Suppose one binary tree. Uh, we only have binary structure. We cannot have more branches. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is a binary structure. Yes. We cannot compare the elements of uh, one branch with the other one. Suppose the noun phrase is, uh, has more than one element. Suppose there is also an a adjective okay. describing the noun. Then uh, uh, those elements cannot be compared with the elements of this branch, right? No. Absolutely not. Yes. More than that, I, I think I understand what you are saying, but to summarize that, the, any element in the structure, we will decide whether that element precedes or follow, precedes or dominates only on the basis of this. And it's never going to have more than binary, but I do understand what you say, even in the binary branching, what if, uh, uh, can, can the two things be compared? The question is not of comparison. The question is of whether it, a node dominates the other one or not, and whether a node precedes the other one or not, will, can only be decided with these, these restrictions. These are, not, these are not in a way definitions, these are restrictions added to that. We already know precedence and dominance. We are only putting some, some restricting condition on them, keeping the structure in mind. Okay? All right. Uh, then we have, uh, we, I only had these things to show you precedence and dominance. Uh, I, I need to talk to you about uh, uh, spec head agreement. That I want to skip for today and I will talk to you about it. When I discuss, uh, I do want to spend another 5 minutes or 5 to 10 minutes talking to you about uh, IP and expansion of IP. Remember, we have, I think we have talked to you about how we can separate uh, the features of IP, features bundled under IP and have a bigger structure. And then it is clear to see that there is a functional layer and there is a lexical layer. And then we, then we get to see or the question comes up that how come the spec, where does the, where does the subject go in that case? And how can a subject be part of inflectional layer? It should be part of a lexical layer. And then I also talk to you that in such situation, the proposal is that the subject of sub, the, the subject of a sentence actually originates within the VP, right? And it was at that point where we can see with clarity the, uh, the notion of deep structure. What does it mean when we say deep structure? And then let us not forget that we are talking about all these things under one simple rubric which is I language. Understand this? Understand this thing? So, let me come back to agreement, sorry, sorry, spec and head agreement and why a spec and head agreement is related, important. What I mean, what I mean by that is this, this is the head and this is the specs. It is not clear here, but there are cases when we expand IP, then we understand why this kind of configuration is important, why a specifier position is important to a head and how can we maximally exploit it to, to understand certain more nuances of natural language.